Rosie, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the programme. Um, what do you think Rishi Sunak should do? Because uh, we're on the edge here of a constitutional crisis, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, I'm really hoping and lots of my colleagues will be hoping too that he does invoke Section 35. We're not sure exactly what that will look like yet, but it should be. I think he's got to stay to decide whether he and Alistair Jack, the Scottish Secretary, can do that. And I hope that they will. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, we have to hope so. Um, what are, because you've given this issue a lot of careful thought, Rosie Duffield, mm. um, what are the real world implications for women in Scotland in the light of this new law? I think you mentioned quite a lot of them then, Mark, actually. It's access to women's single sex services and spaces, which is the main concern for most women. The bill itself, it's worth noting, doesn't mention the word, the word trans at all. It just mentions self-ID. So essentially anyone can self-identify as any sex they want to. So it doesn't mention, you know, if you're suffering as a trans person, if your life's been blighted because you haven't been able to get a gender recognition certificate after living as a trans person. It just simply opens the door to anybody who wants to self-identify as the other sex. And that leaves so many problems, like that quote from uh, Karen Brady said, you know, people can just access whatever they want to access and that cannot be right. Um, isn't this law in place to protect a very vulnerable proportion of the population, which is trans people, who are some of the most prejudged and abused citizens we have? Absolutely. I'm sure that that is the entire thinking behind this law. I think it was done with really good intentions and to protect, as you said, a really small and really vulnerable category of people. But in doing so, it's a bit like a giant fishing net. It, it's going to catch so many other people in, in different... It's a sledgehammer to crack a nut, I'm afraid. And it does leave... Um, I, I know a woman who did a brilliant thread that I've, that I've pinned to my Twitter feed, which is about her personal... Um, care as she's paralysed from the chest downwards. And she is really terrified that she'll lose the opportunity to ask for care by a woman, a biological woman, single sex care. And she needs intimate care every single day. So those are the real world implications of a bill that looks on the surface as though it is protecting that small but vulnerable group of people. Uh, you've taken a very principled stand, uh, standing up, of course, for the rights of biological women. You've paid a high political and personal price. Can you give me a sense mm. of what you've been through, Rosie? Uh, it's very easy in my privileged position to sort of complain about being cancelled because, of course, I can't be cancelled apart from by the electorate. But there are things that uh, I'm not included in or invited to any longer because particularly sort of societies within the Labour Party and, and groups that, you know, Labour students and things have decided that I'm, I'm a terrible, awful person, that my views are obscene, that they want to cancel me, that they would like me drummed out of the party, they'd like me to lose the whip, and it happens most days. So that's uh, not always fun. And it's, it's perverse to me because it's clear that all, all you're calling for is female-only spaces, which is something that women yeah. have spent decades, if not centuries, fighting for. Yeah, I mean, all I want is what we fought for, like you said, and what we want protected, which is in the Equalities Act, the access to those spaces that we really need. And I'm talking about rape centres and prisons and hospital wards and, you know, single sex um, healthcare. So it's, it's nothing massively controversial and changing rooms, you know, all of the things that we should take for granted. And when you talk about things like sport, people understand I'm not being a bigot. I just want women to be protected. Mm. And, and be on their own with biological females. I mean, that's, that's it, really. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I'm not sure that there's a full understanding across all of society about what's at play here, because there's a difference, isn't there, between supporting somebody that feels they're in the wrong body, uh, respecting yeah. how they wish to identify, uh, loving them and making sure they have all of their human rights, versus something yeah. called... Uh, gender ideology, which is something quite different. Can you give us a sense of what the difference is between, you know, a tolerance and acceptance and gender ideology? 
Yeah, I think we're, you know, everybody I know, all the women's rights activists I know, the famous people like Julie Bindle, the writer, Joe Rowling, all the people that are sort of regularly trolled like me, we all want those people to feel safe and okay. And, you know, if they know what they're doing as an adult who really wants to transition, fair play, you know, yeah. let them do that when they know what they're doing. But 16 year olds, that's just ridiculous, frankly. And Keir mentioned that this morning. And this, this ideology, incorporates a kind of it seems there's quite a lot of pressure that particularly a lot of my gay friends a lot of gay activists who've been involved in this these rights for such a long time feel that people are pressured into being something that actually they're not sure they are yet or you know they may be gay they may not need to change sex they might just be gay and expressing themselves in their own way that should be okay you know why do you have to necessarily go down a path where you're labeled but you know that's not for me to say I'm not a trans person I haven't lived like that my only kind of area of expertise if you like is women's rights uh, a brief word Rosie I know you want a Labour government you are a Labour MP but um what's your appraisal of Keir Starmer's stance on this um, I think he came somewhere towards where I am this morning. It was good to hear him say that he thought it was wrong for 16-year-olds to be able to make this decision. And I think it's worth saying what this involves potentially is living your life and changing your birth certificate, possibly having surgery that is completely irreversible. There's a group of people called detransitioners who are warning people that you know, they may not be ready at 16. It's a huge life-changing decision. And I think if he understands that, that's a really good step in my direction. And I think it's just about keeping that, that dialogue going and him and other people on his side of, you know, the party understanding what's at stake here.